Shalom. I'm Eddie Chumney of Hebraic Heritage Ministries, and we welcome you to the Hebraic Heritage Ministries Yeshiva Discipleship Program. In this teaching, we are going to examine some scriptures from the Gospels that Christians commonly misinterpret. And we are going to look at John chapter 1, verse 17, Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 and 18, and then Matthew in chapter 15, verses 1 and 2. And we want to understand these passages from a Hebraic context. So this teaching is going to be entitled, Whose Torah Do You Believe? And so in looking at John in chapter 1, verse 17, it reads, For the Torah was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Yeshua HaMashiach. So in reading this verse, it appears to be giving you a contrast between the Torah that was given by Moses and grace and truth, which seems in the mind of the reader to be contrasting with the Torah that came by Yeshua HaMashiach. So the impression that comes into our mind is choosing between the Torah or grace and truth. So we're going to look at John chapter 1 verse 17 and break it into its details to examine what it really is saying. And then we are going to look at Matthew in chapter 5 verses 17 and 18 which says, Think not that I've come to destroy the Torah or the prophets. I've not come to destroy but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the Torah till all be fulfilled. And so Matthew chapter 5 verse 17 is often interpreted to say or mean that Yeshua, he fulfilled the Torah, meaning that in him fulfilling the Torah, then we are not to follow it. So we're going to give a Hebraic perspective of these verses. And then we're going to finish the teaching by giving you a background and understanding of Matthew chapter 15, verses 1 and 2, which reads, Then came Yeshua, scribes and Pharisees, which were of Jerusalem, saying, Why do the disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat. And so these verses, once again, are often interpreted to mean that what was being questioned was following the Torah. And what we're going to be sharing with you in this teaching is the issue wasn't whether you should follow the Torah. It was how, what is the correct way to follow the Torah? And thus the subject of the teaching, whose Torah do you believe? Or what is the correct way to follow the Torah? And so now let's begin by looking at John chapter one, verse 17 through a Hebraic view. In John chapter 1, verse 17, it reads, For the Torah was given by Moses, and most often when we read this verse, we read it as it fully appears in the English, which says, But grace and truth came by Yeshua HaMashiach. So the impression in the mind of the reader is, There is a contrast that's being made to following the Torah versus grace and truth that comes through Yeshua. The impression in the mind of the reader is we would and we should choose 
between following the Torah or the grace and the truth that comes by Yeshua HaMashiach. However, if we look at John chapter 1, verse 17 more carefully, the word but is in italics. And in my particular Bible, it gives me those verses or those words that contain italics. And when you are reading a verse in your Bible and you happen to have a translation which shows the italics, the italics means it's not in the original text. It has been added by the translators. And so, but is not in the Greek text from which we get our translation. Therefore, the word but does not appear in John chapter 1 verse 17 in the Greek manuscripts. So in looking at John chapter 1 verse 17, we want to ask ourselves, what is the subject of this verse and what is said about the subject? So the subject is the Torah. And if we break apart what's being said in the verse, what is it that's being said about the Torah? Well, the following points are made in John chapter 1, verse 17 regarding the Torah when we parse out the different things that are being said. First of all, the point is being made that the Torah was given by Moses. Number two, that the Torah is truth. Number three, that the Torah is grace. Number four, that grace in the truth of the Torah came by Yeshua HaMashiach. And number five, Yeshua gave the Torah. So let's look at each one of these individual points and do a scriptural study regarding them. The first point of John chapter 1 verse 17, that the Torah was given by Moses. In Exodus in chapter 24 verse 12, it is written, And the Lord said to Moses, Come up to me into the mount and be there, and I will give you tables of stone and a Torah and commandments, which I have written that you may teach them. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 44, it is written, And this is the Torah which Moses set before the children of Israel. So the Torah was given by the God of Israel to Moses to teach to the children of Israel. The Torah was given by Moses. Now in John chapter 1, verse 17, taking the subject of the verse being the Torah, and the last part of the verse says, came by Yeshua HaMashiach. And so in parsing out the words in between, we can read it, for the Torah came by Yeshua HaMashiach. In other words, Yeshua gave the Torah at Mount Sinai. In Isaiah chapter 33, verse 22, it is written, For the Lord is our judge, the Lord is our lawgiver, the Lord is our king, he will save us. So looking at Isaiah chapter 33, verse 22, in this verse, four things are said about the Lord. Number one, he is our judge. Number two, he is our lawgiver. Number three, he is our king. Number four, he will save us. So let's look at those four items and does the scripture teach that these things are associated with Yeshua? So first, the Lord, he saves us. Does the scriptures say that Yeshua saves us or that he is our savior? Well, let's look at Matthew in chapter 1, verse 21, which says, And she, referring to Mary, shall bring forth a son, and you shall call his name in Hebrew, Yeshua, which means salvation. So why is the name of the Messiah called 
Yeshua or salvation? Because the verse goes on to say, he will save his people from their sins. Yeshua, he will save his people from their sins. And then in Luke, in chapter 2, and in verse 11, it says, For unto you was born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. So in Isaiah chapter 33, verse 22, it says, The Lord, he will save us. Well, in Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, Luke chapter 2, verse 11, it says that Yeshua, he saves us, and that he is our Savior. So in Isaiah chapter 33, verse 22, it says the Lord is our king. Does the scripture say that Yeshua is our king or is the king of Israel? In John, in chapter 1, in verse 49, it is written, Nathanael answered and said unto him, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. And then in Revelation in chapter 19 and verse 16, it is written, speaking of Yeshua, and he had on his vesture and on a thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So Yeshua is the King of Israel. He is the King of Kings and he is the Lord of Lords. So in Isaiah chapter 33, verse 22, it says, the Lord is our judge. Is Yeshua our judge? Is he the judge of all the earth? Well, in Romans, in chapter 14 and verse 10, it is written, For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Messiah. And so... In Isaiah chapter 33, verse 22, it says about the Lord, he will save us. It says he's our king. It says that he's our judge. So Yeshua is our judge, Romans chapter 14, verse 10. Yeshua is our king, John chapter 1, verse 49, Revelation chapter 19, verse 16. And Yeshua saves us, Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, Luke chapter 2, verse 11. So Isaiah chapter 33, verse 22 says, the one that is our judge, the one that is our king, the one that saves us is also our lawgiver. So James chapter four, verse 12, the first part of the verse says, there is one lawgiver who is able to save. The one that is able to save, who is Yeshua, he's the one that saves his people from their sins. He is also the lawgiver. Yeshua is our judge, Yeshua is our king, Yeshua is our savior, and he also gave the Torah at Mount Sinai. So John chapter 1 verse 17 does indeed say that the Torah came by Yeshua HaMashiach. Continuing to look at John chapter 1 verse 17, speaking of the Torah, it says that it is truth. Let's look at some scriptures that tell us that the Torah is truth. Psalm 119 verse 142, it is written, Your righteousness is an everlasting righteousness and your Torah is the truth. Psalm 119 verse 151, You are near, O Lord, and all your commandments are truth. The Torah is truth, all your commandments are our truth. Now, Malachi chapter 2, verses 1 and verse 6. And now, O ye priests, this commandment is for you. The Torah of truth was in his mouth. Now, in John chapter 14, verse 6, Yeshua said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes unto the Father but by me. In John, in chapter 8, verses 31 and 32, it is written, Then said Yeshua to those Jews who believed on him, If you continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed, and you will know the truth, 
and the truth will make you free. So the Torah or the commandments are truth. Yeshua is the truth. And following Yeshua is following the truth. And by knowing the truth, by knowing Yeshua, by knowing the Torah, by keeping his words, by keeping his Torah and his commandments, is how we are set free. Yeshua sets us free, and being obedient to him causes us to be free. It's sin that causes us to be in bondage. So John chapter 1 verse 17 tells us that the Torah is truth. Further looking at John chapter 1 verse 17, it says the Torah gives grace. Let's see how this is so. The God of Israel himself is a God of grace and mercy. In Jeremiah chapter 9 verse 23 and verse 24 it is written, Thus says the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let him that glories glory in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord which exercises loving kindness. And this word that's translated loving kindness is the Hebrew word chesed, which means grace or mercy. We can see how grace or mercy is a characteristic of the God of Israel himself from Psalm 117, verses 1 and 2. Oh, praise the Lord, all ye nations. Praise him, all ye people. For his merciful kindness, it's the Hebrew word chesed, and it was translated in the previous passage as loving kindness, that it is great toward us. In Exodus chapter 34, verses 6 and 7, it is written, And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. So we see that grace or mercy is a characteristic of the God of Israel himself. And since Yeshua is truth and grace is a characteristic of the God of Israel himself, we see that Yeshua is not only truth, but he is gracious and he is merciful as well. The Torah defines for us the definition by the God of Israel of what is sin. In Romans chapter 3 verse 20 it is written, for by the Torah is the knowledge of sin. Romans chapter 7 verse 7, what shall we say then? Is the Torah sin? Is following the Torah sin? Is following the Torah bondage? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin or what sin is but by the Torah. For I did not know lust except the Torah had said, you shall not covet. Or I had not known that lust is sin unless the Torah tells me that you shall not covet. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 4, it says, Whoever commits sin transgresses the Torah. For sin is the transgression of the Torah. So when we repent of our sin, we have to repent of what sin is, since sin is transgressing the Torah. When we repent for transgressing the Torah, that's when we repent of our sin. And we need to repent of our sin, transgressing the Torah, and coming to Yeshua and receiving forgiveness of sin through his shed blood. Once we receive him as our Savior and our Lord. It is the desire of the God of Israel that his people repent of their sin. Isaiah chapter 58 verse 1. Cry aloud, spare not, lift up your voice like a trumpet and show my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. 
Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 30. Therefore, I will judge you, O house of Israel, every one according to his ways, says the Lord God. Repent and turn yourselves from all your transgressions, so iniquity shall not be your ruin. We can see from Ezekiel chapter 18, verses 21 through 23, that the God of Israel desires for all people to come to repentance, as it is written. But if the wicked will turn from all his sins that he has committed and keep all my statutes and do that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live, he shall not die. All his transgressions that he has committed that shall not be mentioned unto him in his righteousness that he has done, that is, to repent, he shall live. Have I any pleasure at all that the wicked die, says the Lord God, and not that he should return or repent from his ways and live? I have no pleasure in the death of him that dies, says the Lord God. Wherefore, turn yourselves and you shall live. Now, the Bible teaches us that breaking any part of the commandments of God is sin and it is equivalent to breaking the covenant as a whole. Romans chapter 3 verse 23 it is written, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. James chapter 2 verse 10, for whosoever shall keep the whole Torah but yet offend or break one point or one part of the Torah or one commandment of the Torah, he is guilty of breaking the entire Torah because the Torah is a covenant that was given to the nation of Israel. First John chapter three, verse four, whoever commits sin transgresses the Torah for sin is the transgression of the Torah. The Torah is a covenant that the one who gave the Torah, that is Yeshua the Messiah, he's the lawgiver, it is a covenant that he made with his people. Exodus chapter 19 verse 5. Now therefore, if you will obey my voice and keep my covenant. Exodus chapter 34 verse 27. And the Lord said to Moses, write these words, for after the tenor of these words, I have made a covenant with you and with Israel. Transgressing the Torah is breaking the covenant. Isaiah chapter 24 and verse 5. The earth also is defiled under the inhabitants thereof because they have transgressed the Torah, changed the ordinance, and broken the everlasting covenant. Hosea chapter 8 verse 1. Set a trumpet to your mouth because they have transgressed my covenant and trespassed against my Torah. Psalm chapter 78 verse 10. They kept not the covenant of God and refused to walk in his Torah. Amos chapter 2 verse 4. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Judah and for four, I will not turn away the punishment thereof because they have despised the Torah of the Lord and have not kept his commandments. So sin or transgressing the Torah is breaking the covenant that the God of Israel has with his people. Disobedience to the Torah results in a curse. Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 28. In a curse, if you will not obey the commandments of the Lord your God. And among the curses, in Deuteronomy chapter 27, verse 26, it says, Cursed is he that confirms not all the words of this Torah to do them, and all the people shall say, Amen. Sin, transgressing the Torah, results in death. Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 20. The soul that sins, it shall die. Romans chapter 6, verse 23. For the wages of sin is death. James chapter 1, verse 15. Then when lust has conceived, it brings forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. The Torah tells us that sin is punishable by hanging on a tree. Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse 22. 
And if a man has committed a sin worthy of death and he be put to death, you shall hang him on a tree. Yeshua took upon himself our sins when he died on the tree. First Peter chapter two, verse 24. Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree that we being dead to sins should live under righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. Now let's look again at John chapter one, verse 17, which explains to us that the grace of the Torah came through Yeshua HaMashiach. For the Torah, grace and truth came by Yeshua HaMashiach. And so how did the grace of the Torah come through Yeshua? It's because by breaking the Torah, which is the covenant of the God of Israel, it is punishable by death. The soul that sins shall die. But Yeshua, in showing the mercy of the Torah, he offers forgiveness of sin through his shed blood if we are willing to repent of our sins, if we're willing to forsake the disobedience to the Torah and endeavor to follow the Torah and the commandments of Yeshua, and in doing so, receiving forgiveness of our sin through his shed blood, when, he, when we accept him as our personal Savior and Lord. In Matthew, in chapter 9, in verse 6, Yeshua explains to us that he has the power to forgive sins but that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. Mark chapter 2, verse 5. When Yeshua saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, your sins be forgiven you. We are able to be forgiven of sin, iniquity, and transgression. And these are different categories of sin. David proclaimed those who are blessed by the God of Israel whose transgressions, sins, and iniquity are forgiven. Psalm 32, verses 1 and 2 and verse 5, it is written, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputes not iniquity, and whose spirit there is no guile. I acknowledged my sin unto you, and my iniquity have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and you forgave my iniquity of my sin. Our sins were laid upon Yeshua when he died on the tree. Isaiah chapter 53 Verses four through six. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. He was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of of us all. Yeshua took upon himself the punishment of our sins. In 2 Corinthians in chapter 5 verse 21, it is written, "For he has made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him." We are righteous or in right standing before the God of Israel because of what Yeshua did for us when he shed his blood for the forgiveness of our sins. When we repent of our sins and receive the forgiveness of sins that he offers to us, this is how our righteousness is of him. It's through the shedding of blood that atonement is made for sin. 
Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11, it is written, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes an atonement for the soul. Yeshua is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John chapter 1, verse 29. And this is where Yochanan, John the Immerser proclaimed, Behold, the Lamb of God, referring to Yeshua, which takes away the sin of the world. We are saved, redeemed by the blood of Yeshua. By accepting Yeshua as our personal Lord and Savior and by trusting in his shed blood, our sins are forgiven when we repent. Romans chapter 3, verses 24 and 25. Being justified freely by the grace through the redemption that is in Yeshua HaMashiach, which God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. We can see how we are forgiven of our sin through the shed blood of Yeshua and are saved or are redeemed from Ephesians chapter 1 verse 7 as it is written in whom we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace in John chapter 14 verse 15 Yeshua said if you love me keep my commandments when he said these words, he was making a reference to the very first place in the Bible where we see the phrase, love me and keep my commandments. And that is in Exodus in chapter 20 in the chapter on the giving of the Ten Commandments. And the one who spoke the words, love me and keep my commandments, was Yahweh Elohim, the one who brought his people out of Egypt, Exodus in chapter 20, verse 2 and verse 6. I am the Lord your God, which brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. And I show mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. The God of Israel shows grace or mercy to those who seek to follow his Torah. Exodus chapter 20 verse 6 says, Showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Psalm 103 verses 17 and 18. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. To such as keep his covenant and to those that remember his commandments to do them. So therefore John chapter 1 verse 17 isn't contrasting following the Torah versus having faith in Yeshua HaMashiach. It's telling us that the grace in the truth of the Torah was expressed or revealed through Yeshua the Messiah. And this was done when he shed his blood on the tree to provide forgiveness of sins for those who would repent of their sins, meaning those who would repent for transgressing the Torah, meaning they would endeavor in their heart to not only receive forgiveness of sins, salvation through Yeshua, but who would endeavor to seek to follow Yeshua and follow his commandments or his Torah. We can see how grace or mercy is given to those who seek to follow the Torah or the commandments of the God of Israel, Psalm 119, verse 29. Grant me your Torah graciously. Proverbs chapter 31, verse 26. She opens her mouth with wisdom and in her tongue is the Torah of kindness. A stony heart doesn't follow the Torah. A stony heart is a rebellious heart. Zechariah chapter 7, verses 11 and 12. But they refused to hearken. They pulled away the shoulder. They stopped their ears that they should not hear. Yes, they made their hearts as adamant stone. 
lest they should hear the Torah and the words which the Lord of hosts has sent in his spirit by the former prophets. So here, a stony heart is defined as not hearing, not endeavoring to follow and obey the Torah. So what is the meaning of true repentance? True repentance is a change of heart, a change of heart attitude, which results in a change of behavior. And so true repentance is the removal of the stony heart and replacing it with a heart of flesh. It is the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, that helps us to follow the Torah or the commandments of Yeshua, the Messiah. In Ezekiel chapter 36, verses 26 and 27, it is written, A new heart will I give you. A new spirit will I put within you. What happens when the God of Israel gives us his indwelling Ruach HaKodesh? The result is the following. In Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 27, I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. This is what Paul was referring to in Romans chapter seven, verse 22, when he says, I delight in the Torah of God after the inward man. And so he seeks to follow the Torah through the help in the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Through the new covenant, or in Hebrew, it should be understood as the renewing of the covenant. Since the original covenant at Mount Sinai was broken, the God of Israel desired through the shed blood of Yeshua to renew that covenant. And in renewing the covenant to remove the stony heart and to replace it with the heart of flesh through the help and the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And in Hebrews, in chapter 10, verses 16 and 17, it is written, This is the new covenant or the renewed covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my Torah into their hearts and I will write it in their minds. And this is a quote to Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 33. And then in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 17, in their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. We need to confess our sins or the way in which we have not followed the Torah to the God of Israel in order to receive forgiveness of our sins. In 1 John chapter 1, verses 7 through 9, it is written, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Yeshua HaMashiach cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin or that we haven't broken the Torah, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, if we confess that we have transgressed the Torah, not followed the Torah. He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins, of transgressing the Torah, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Unrighteousness is when we sin. When we are forgiven of our sin, we are to depart from doing that sin. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 19 it is written, Nevertheless, the foundation of God stands sure, having this seal. The Lord knows them that are his, and let everyone that names the name of Messiah depart from iniquity, depart from transgressing the Torah. So that is a detailed examination of John chapter 1 and verse 17. And so in reviewing it, in its detail, we can see that the verse was not contrasting following the Torah versus following Yeshua. It was explaining that the Torah was given by Moses, that the Torah is truth, 
the Torah is grace and that the Torah came by Yeshua HaMashiach or that he gave the Torah at Mount Sinai and not only the truth, but the grace of the Torah was expressed or revealed through Yeshua the Messiah and this was done when he shed his blood on the tree for the forgiveness of our sins. And now we are going to look at Matthew chapter 5 verses 17 and 18 and then a little bit later in the teaching Matthew chapter 15 verses 1 and 2. And so the issue here in Matthew chapter 5 verses 17 and 18 in Matthew chapter 15 verses 1 and 2 is not whether we should follow the Torah, it's how and what's the correct way to do it. So this is the, the challenge, the debate that Yeshua is having with primarily the Pharisees in his day. And the reason being is because given that he gave the Torah at Mount Sinai, he knew the intent in the way in which the Torah was to be followed since he gave the Torah. So now Matthew, in chapter 5, verse 17, Yeshua said, Do not even think the thought that I've come to destroy the Torah or the prophets. Interestingly enough, the very verse where Yeshua says, Think not. Don't even consider the thought that I've come to destroy the Torah or the prophets. Oftentimes, this verse is quoted as an evidence that Yeshua came and did away with the Torah. But we're going to look and understand the verse in its Hebraic context. So, the verse says, Think not that I've come to destroy the Torah or the prophets. I'm not come to destroy, but to fulfill. So, the misunderstanding in the minds of many Christians regarding this verse is the words destroy and fulfill. And in their minds, they render fulfill as completing and thus doing away with. But I'd like to share with you a Hebraic view of the meaning of destroy and fulfill. And I'm going to share with you this text and the explanation of it from the book, Understanding the Difficult Words of Jesus by David Biven and Roy Blizzard Jr. And on page 154, they explain the following. The only solution to understanding Matthew chapter 5, verse 17 is to put the Greek back into the Hebrew or Hebrew thought. Once we set this passage in its Hebraic context, it makes sense. Undoubtedly, in trying to understand this passage, everything hinges on the meaning of the words destroy and fulfill in verse 17. What did Yeshua or Jesus mean by destroy the law and fulfill the law? Destroy and fulfill are technical terms used in rabbinic argumentation. When a rabbi felt that a colleague had misinterpreted a passage of scripture, he would in effect say, you are destroying the Torah. In other words, you're taking the commandment and you're teaching the application of it incorrectly. And if you're giving the incorrect application of the meaning of the text, you are in effect destroying the heart or the purpose of the commandment. That's what it means to destroy the law. Continuing from understanding the difficult words of Jesus, page 154, what we see in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17 and following is a rabbinic discussion. And someone had accused Yeshua of destroying the law. Of course, neither Yeshua nor his accuser would ever think of literally destroying the Torah or to give it an incorrect understanding or application. 
Furthermore, it would never enter the accuser's mind to charge Yeshua or Jesus with intent to abolish part or all of the Mosaic law. What is being called into question is the correct way to interpret the Torah or to interpret the meaning of the text. So continuing in Matthew chapter 5, verse 18, Yeshua says, For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the Torah till all be fulfilled. In commenting regarding this verse in the book, Understanding the Difficult Words of Jesus, on page 155, it says, Never imagine for a moment, Jesus says, that I intend to do away with the law by misinterpreting it. My intent is not to weaken or negate the law, but by properly interpreting God's written word, my aim is to establish it, that is to make it more lasting. I would never invalidate the law by effectively removing something from it through misinterpretation, on the contrary, heaven and earth would sooner disappear than something from the Torah. Not even the smallest letter of the alphabet, the Yod, nor even its decorative spurs that appears on the Hebrew letters in a Torah scroll will ever disappear from the Torah. Next, I'm going to show you here in this figure, the number one shows you the Hebrew letter Yod. And then number two is the decoration that is put on the letter. Number three is the Hebrew letter Lamed. And number four, we have a decoration that is put on the Lamed. So these decorations are called here in Matthew, in chapter 5, verse 18, tittles. In the book, This is the Torah, on page 101, the question is asked of the Torah, why are some letters in the Torah scroll embellished? The embellishments used by the scribes to decorate the letters in the Torah are called tagin. These embellishments are referred to in the Talmud as Keterim, or crowns. The New Testament in Matthew chapter 5, verse 18, refers to them as tittles. Seven of the 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet are decorated with tagines, or tittles. And the following letters have these decorations. The shin, the ayin, the tet, the noon, Zion, Gimel, and Zadi. In the Sanchino, Midrash Rabbah, volume 1, page 71, it explains that the Torah has no end. So, from Genesis in chapter 2, verse 1, which says, And the heavens and the earth were finished, the Midrash is as follows. I have seen an end to every purpose, but your commandment is exceedingly broad. Psalm 119, verse 96. Everything has a measure. Heaven and earth has a measure, except one thing which has no measure. What is it? That is the Torah. So the rabbis teach that the Torah has no measure. The Torah has no end. And now in the Sinchino Midrash Rabbah, volume 3, page 103, it is explained that the smallest letter of the Torah will remain. When God gave the Torah to Israel, he inserted therein positive and negative commands and gave some commandments for a king. As it says from Deuteronomy chapter 17, verses 16 and 17, only he shall not multiply horses to himself, neither shall he multiply wives to himself, that his heart turn not away, neither silver and gold. But we see in First Kings in chapter 11, First Kings in chapter 
11, in verse 1, it says, And King Solomon loved many strange women, together with the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, the Ammonites, the Edomites, the Zidonians, and the Hittites. Of the nations concerning which the Lord said unto the children of Israel, You shall not go into them, neither shall they come in unto you. For surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. Yet Solomon cleaved unto these in love. And he had 700 wise princesses and 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. And then it goes on to say that not only did Solomon multiply wives unto himself, but he multiplied horses unto himself as well. And so this is the reference going back to this Midrash, which we will pick up, which says, but Solomon arose and studied the reason of God's decree saying, why did God command he shall not multiply wives to himself? Is it not that his heart turned not away? Well, I will multiply and still my heart will turn not away, Solomon said. So the rabbi said, at this time, and this is the Midrash, the yod of the word Yarbeh in the text went up on high and prostrated itself before God and said, Master of the universe, have you not said that no letter shall ever be abolished from the Torah? Behold, Solomon has now arisen and abolished one. Who knows? Today he has abolished one letter. Tomorrow he will abolish another until the whole Torah will be nullified. God replied, Solomon and a thousand like him will pass away, but the smallest tittle will not be erased from you. So not only every tittle will remain of the Torah, but every yod as well. In the Sanchino Midrash Rabbah, volume 4, pages 238 and 239, it says, The Holy One, blessed be he, answered, Not even a single yod that is in you shall ever be made void. So we see there when Yeshua said in Matthew in chapter 5 and verse 18 that not one yod or tittle will pass from the Torah. This was the teaching and the understanding of the people. And so in effect, what Yeshua was saying in Matthew in chapter 5 verse 17 and 18 Don't think the thought that I've come to give you the incorrect interpretation of the Torah. I've come to give you the correct interpretation. I've come to fulfill it. Why? Because Yeshua gave the Torah at Mount Sinai. So not only did I come to give you the correct interpretation of the Torah, but all elements and aspect of the Torah will be fulfilled down to the very smallest letter, and even the decorations that are on the letters. And so the debate or the issue that Yeshua had with the Pharisees and that the Pharisees had with him was not whether you should follow the Torah, but the correct way how to follow the Torah. And so how did the Pharisees in Yeshua's day How did they view seeing following the Torah? Because it was the correct way to do it is the confrontation in the issue that Yeshua is having with the Pharisees in the Gospels. And so how would the Pharisees be destroying the Torah? It is because they have a perspective of the Torah that there were two Torahs that were given at Mount Sinai. One that is written, which we have a copy of, and the other was given orally. And they teach that the rabbis were given the authority from Mount Sinai to interpret the written text And their rulings is 
the way in which the people should follow the Torah. And so their interpretation of how you follow the written in their rulings is regarded as being the oral Torah. And according to the Pharisees or the rabbis, they see that the oral Torah supersedes the written Torah. And given the fact that Yeshua is the one that gave the Torah at Mount Sinai, and in Ezekiel chapter 36, verses 26 and 27, Romans chapter 7, verse 22, the way in which we are to follow the Torah is through the help and the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. This is the correct way to follow it. And that is in contrast to the interpretation of the rabbis who do not believe that Yeshua is the Messiah. They do not look for the Holy Spirit to lead and guide the people in following the Torah. They instead give the interpretation of how the Torah should be followed to the people. And then they teach that their interpretation and their rulings should be followed in its fullness. And so that is the contrast that we have in the debate that was going on between Yeshua and the Pharisees. What is destroying the Torah? What is the incorrect interpretation? What is fulfilling the Torah? What is the correct interpretation? Now, in order to understand the perspective that the Pharisees had on the Torah, we need to understand that when we're reading about the biblical Pharisees, that it was from the biblical Pharisees that they ultimately put their oral teachings written down in a document known as the Talmud. And so because these are the rulings and the teachings of the rabbis, instead of being called Pharisaicism today, this is called Rabbinic Judaism or sometimes called Orthodox Judaism or sometimes all of that is shortened to be just Judaism. So from the Wikipedia Encyclopedia, it explains who are the biblical Pharisees and their connection to Rabbinic Judaism or Orthodox Judaism today. The Pharisees from the Hebrew Parashim from Parash meaning to separate, were depending on the time a political party, a social movement, and a school of thought among Jews that flourished during the Second Temple era, from the year 536 before the Common Era to the year 70. After the destruction of the Second Temple, Pharisaic Judaism came to be known as Rabbinic Judaism and then simply as Judaism. The Pharisees were an ancient sect of Judaism. They existed during the time of rabbis Hillel the Elder and Shammai and during the time of Jesus. They are the direct predecessor to what eventually became known as Rabbinic Judaism. In contrast to other Jewish groups of the time, such as the Sadducees, the Pharisees held that the books of the Tanakh or the Hebrew Bible, also the written Hebrew scriptures have always been transmitted in parallel with an oral tradition. They pointed as proof to the text of the Torah itself, where they said many words were left undefined and many procedures mentioned without explanation or instruction. The reader is assumed to be familiar with the details from other sources. This parallel set of material was originally transmitted orally and came to be known as the oral law. By the year 200, much of this material was added together into the Mishnah, which is the core document of Rabbinic Judaism. In the art scroll of Genesis, in the introduction on page 41, it explains that the rabbis teach that the oral Torah was given at Mount Sinai. The oral law was taught in its entirety to Moses during his 40 days and 40 nights in heaven. From the Sanchino, Midrash Rabbah, volume 6, page 
736, the rabbis teach that all of oral law, the Talmud, was given at Mount Sinai. They were all given to Moses on Sinai, and they contained statutes and ordinances, the Torah, Mishnah, Talmud, and Haggadah. In the Talmud, in Barahot 5a, the rabbis teach that the oral Torah was taught at Mount Sinai. Rabbi Levi, son of Hama, says further in the name of Rabbi Simeon, son of Lachish. What is the meaning of Exodus chapter 24, verse 12? And I will give you the tables of stone in the law and the commandment which I have written that you may teach them. So here is their explanation of the meaning of that verse. Tables of stone, these are the Ten Commandments. The law, that is the written Torah. The commandment, that is the Mishnah, which I have written. These are the prophets and the Hagiographa, that you may teach them. This is the Gemara. It teaches us that all these things were given to Moses on Mount Sinai. In the Sanchino Midrash Rabbah, volume 3, page 536, the rabbis teach that the questions that a student asked his rabbi was also given at Mount Sinai. Write thou these words. It is written, If I write for him so many things of my Torah, they have accounted as a strange thing. This is quoting Hosea in chapter 11, verse 12. When God revealed himself at Sinai to give the Torah to Israel, he communicated it to Moses in this order. First, the written Torah, the Mishnah, the Talmud, and Agadah, as it says. And God spoke all these words, Exodus chapter 20, verse 1. Even the question that a pupil asked his teacher, God told Moses at that time on Mount Sinai. In the Sanchino Midrash Rabbah, volume 6, page 613, the rabbis teach that the oral law or the Mishnah supersedes or is greater in authority than the written text, the written scripture. The Mishnah, which is greater than the scripture. In, in the Sanchino Midrash Rabbah, volume 9, page 32, the rabbis explain how they see that the oral Torah is above that which is written. The injunctions or the rulings of the scribes are more beloved than those of the Torah itself. Why? Because if a person says there is no command to put on phylacteries, thus transgressing a commandment of the Torah, the Torah does not give any penalty. But if he says that there are five compartments in the phylacteries, thus transgressing the ruling of the rabbis, he is subject to penalty by the rabbis. In the Talmud, in Erevin 21b, it explains that the rabbis' interpretation or the oral law overrides biblical written commandment. My son, be more careful in the observance of the words of the scribes than in the words of the written Torah. For in the laws of the Torah, there are positive and negative precepts. But as to the laws of the scribes, whoever transgresses any of the enactments of the scribes incurs the penalty of death. Now from the Talmud, Pesahim 115a, this thought continues. And even on the view that precepts cannot nullify each other, that only applies to a biblical commandment with another biblical commandment or a rabbinical ruling with another rabbinical ruling. But in the case of a conflict between a scriptural and a rabbinical or oral ruling, the rabbinical or the oral ruling comes and nullifies or does away with the written scriptural text. In the introduction to the Mishnah, Moses Maimonides, also known by the acronym of Rambam, who lived in the Middle Ages from 1135 to 1204, 
explains the following. If there are a thousand prophets, all of them of the stature of Elijah and Elisha, giving a certain interpretation, and a thousand and one rabbis giving the opposite interpretation, you shall incline after the majority, is the oral interpretation and rendering of Exodus chapter 23, verse 2. And the law is according to the thousand and one rabbis, not according to the thousand prophets. God did not permit us to learn from the prophets, only from the rabbis, who are men of logic and reason. The rabbis teach that even the God of Israel himself must listen to and abide by the rulings of the rabbis. From Pesikta, Rabati, section 3. A person must not say, I will not keep the commandment of the elders because they are not from the Torah. The Almighty says to such a person, No, my son, rather all that they decree upon you observe. And then there's a quote from Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 11. According to the instruction which they teach you, even I, the God of Israel, Yahweh, must obey their decree. As it is written, and they quote Job 22, verse 28, you will decree and he will fulfill it. Furthermore, rabbinic Judaism teaches that when two rabbis have different opinions, that both their opinions are from the God of Israel. From the Talmud in Erevin 13b, Rabbi Abba stated in the name of Samuel, for three years there was a dispute between Beit Shammai, the house of Shammai, and Beit Hillel, the house of Hillel, who were the two major houses of Pharisaic Judaism in the first century, the former claiming the halakha, or the way you follow the Torah, is in agreement with our views, and the latter contending, no, the halakha, or the way you follow the Torah, is in agreement with our views. Then a bot kol or a heavenly voice said the following. The utterance of both are the words of the living God. But the halakha, the way in which the Torah is to be followed, is in agreement with the rulings of Beit Hillel. Rabbinic Judaism teaches that their rulings are greater and above the voice of heaven. In the Talmud and Baba Metzia 59b, it states the following. It has been taught on that day, Rabbi Eliezer brought forward every imaginable argument, but they, that is the other rabbis, didn't accept them. So he said to them, if the halakha, the way we should follow the Torah, agrees with me, let this carob tree prove it. Thereupon the carob tree was torn a hundred cubits out of its place. Others said, no, it was 400 cubits. And so the other rabbi said to Rabbi Eliezer, no proof can be brought from a carob tree. Again, Rabbi Eliezer said to them, if the halakha agrees with me, let the stream of water prove it. Whereupon the stream of water flowed backwards. And so the other rabbi said to him, no proof can be brought from a stream of water. So Rabbi Eliezer said again, if the halakha agrees with me, let it be proved by heaven itself. Whereupon a heavenly voice cried out, Why do you dispute with Rabbi Eliezer, seeing that in all matters the halakha agrees with him? So in this midrash, you might say, we are told that heaven itself agreed with Rabbi Eliezer. Here was the response from the other rabbis. Rabbi Joshua arose and exclaimed, It is not in heaven, meaning the Torah is not in heaven, meaning that we don't listen to heavenly voices. What did he mean by this? Said Rabbi Jeremiah, that the Torah had already been given at Mount Sinai. So we pay no attention to a heavenly voice because you have long since written in the Torah at Mount Sinai. And this is their interpretation of Exodus chapter 23, verse two. After the majority of rabbis, you must listen or accept their ruling. In the Sanchino Midrash Rabbah, volume nine, page 33, we see that the rabbis teach that you should follow their rulings even if they say right is left and left is right. 
In the words of the scribes, it is written, according to the Torah, which they shall teach you. This is Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 11. It does not say which the Torah shall teach you, but which they shall teach you. Nor does it say according to the judgment which it shall tell you, but which they shall tell you. You shall not turn aside from the sentence which they shall declare unto you to the right hand nor to the left. If they tell you that the right hand is right and the left hand left, listen to them. And even if they tell you that the right hand is left and the left hand is right, still listen to them. So given this was the mindset and the doctrine in the teaching of the Pharisees, it is this belief system that Yeshua encountered when he was teaching and when he was with his disciples. So therefore you can see how there can be a dispute between Yeshua and the Pharisees regarding the correct way in which to follow the Torah. And if the Pharisees view that Yeshua was not following the Torah according to the ruling of the rabbis, they would see that he is destroying the Torah. But given that Yeshua himself gave the Torah at Mount Sinai, he knew what he meant by the commandments that he gave, so therefore he had a right to be able to teach and to show the correct understanding and the correct way to follow the Torah. Therefore, Yeshua would be seeing that the Pharisees, in certain instances, would be destroying the Torah or would be incorrectly teaching the Torah. So, there was the approach of the Pharisees, which is you obey the Torah according to the rulings of the rabbis, which even heaven itself must listen to, versus Yeshua teaching to follow his commandments because he gave the Torah and the way that we're supposed to follow his Torah is by his spirit. And so then the issue becomes not whether you should follow the Torah, but whose Torah do you believe? Whose Torah do you follow? What way do you follow the Torah. And to the Pharisees, they view it according to rabbinical ruling, and they see that the oral Torah, the rabbinical ruling, supersedes what is in the written text. So let's summarize what we've learned regarding how the Pharisees see following the Torah, or how rabbinic Judaism or Orthodox Judaism or Judaism sees following the Torah, which in certain instances from Yeshua's perspective would be destroying the Torah or incorrectly interpreting and teaching it. Number one, the oral Torah or the Talmud is above the written Torah. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Number two, that you are not to listen to the prophets even if they are correct, if it doesn't agree with the rabbis. Number three, don't listen to heaven itself or the voice of the God of Israel if it disagrees with the rabbis. Number four, that the God of Israel himself must follow the teachings of the rabbis. So given that the Pharisees in Yeshua's day taught the way in which you were to follow the Torah was according to the majority ruling of the rabbis. With that context, now we can better understand what Yeshua was claiming, the way he was following the Torah, and the way he understood to follow the Torah. He says in John chapter 7, verse 16, Yeshua answered them and said, my doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. John chapter eight, verse 28. Then said Yeshua unto them, as my father has taught me, I speak these things. John chapter 12, verse 49. 
For I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me, he gave me commandment, what I should say and what I should speak. John chapter 14, verse 24. The word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. So Yeshua claimed he was following the Torah of his Father in contrast to following the rulings of the rabbis. He looked to his father as supreme authority, not to the rabbis as supreme authority. Therefore, this brought about a conflict in the way in which you should follow the Torah. And so because of this conflict, that is the background of understanding why Yeshua said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, don't think that I've come to destroy the Torah. I've not come to destroy, but to fulfill. So don't think that I'm not following the Torah. I am. Not only am I following the Torah, but I'm giving you the correct understanding and teaching of how you follow the Torah. Because Every letter, even the smallest letter of the Torah will come to pass and even the decoration crowns on the letters will even be fulfilled. Now, we are going to look at Matthew chapter 15 and verse 2. And here we're going to see the phrase, the tradition of the elders. It says, Why did the disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? What was meant by this phrase, the tradition of the elders? Did it mean just following Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy? And the answer is no. It referred to following the rulings of the rabbis, following oral law, putting it above written law, and following it instead of following Yeshua, And what he taught, given that he gave the Torah and Yeshua following and doing what he heard and learned and was taught by his father. So in the works of Josephus in 13.10.6, he explains the meaning of the tradition of the fathers. It's a term that refers to to the oral law or following the rulings of the rabbis. The Pharisees have delivered to the people a great many observances by succession from their fathers, which are not written in the law of Moses. And for that reason, it is that the Sadducees reject them and say that we are to esteem those observances to be obligatory which are in the written word, but are not to observe what are derived from the tradition of the forefathers or the tradition of the elders. So in Matthew chapter 15, verse 1, it is written, Then came to Yeshua scribes and Pharisees, which were of Jerusalem, saying, Matthew 15, verse 2, Why do the disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. So according to the rulings of the rabbis, according to oral law, according to the tradition of the elders, you must wash your hands before you eat as a part of following what they say was given at Mount Sinai. If you do not, then you would, in the mind of the Pharisees, be sinning. In the Torah Anthology, volume 17, which is a commentary to Deuteronomy, on page 32, it explains the following. Ritual washing of both hands before a meal containing bread is mandatory even if one's hands are immaculate or do not need washing. Furthermore, it is taught in the Talmud in Barahot 19a that you could be excommunicated for not washing your hands, meaning not obeying the rulings of the rabbis. 
Rabbi Joshua, son of Levi, further said, in 24 places we find that the Beit Din, that is the rabbinical court, inflicted excommunication for an insult to a teacher, and they are all recorded in the Mishnah. Rabbi Eliezer asked him where, and he replied, see if you can find them. So he went and examined and found three cases. One of a scholar who threw contempt on the washing of the hands. Another of one who made derogatory remarks about scholars after their death. And a third of one who made himself too familiar towards heaven. So given that the Pharisees taught that the way in which you are to follow the Torah is that you must wash your hands before you eat. In Luke chapter 11, verses 37 through 39, we have an occurrence where Yeshua is having a meal with a Pharisee. And as he spake, a certain Pharisee besought to dine with him, and he went in and sat down to eat. And when the Pharisee saw it, he marveled that he, that is Yeshua, did not first wash before dinner. So in the mind of the Pharisee, he's not following the Torah. He's not following the rulings of the rabbis. And so it's that context that Yeshua replied in Luke chapter 11, verse 39, Now do you Pharisees make clean the outside of the cup, that is your hands, and platter, but your inward part, that is your heart, is full of ravening and wickedness. So how did Yeshua answer the question and the accusation that his disciples did not in all instances and in all occasions follow the rulings or the decrees of the rabbis and in the case of washing their hands before they had a meal with bread, they did not follow. And so Yeshua answered this way in Matthew chapter 15, verse 3. And he answered and said unto them, why do you also transgress the commandment of God, that is, to destroy the written Torah, or to incorrectly teach the heart of the written Torah by your tradition, meaning your oral law interpretation, or through the ruling of the rabbis? Now, according to the way in which you keep the Sabbath, the rulings of the rabbis, you cannot work, which they define as carrying a bed, on the Sabbath. John chapter 5, verses 8 through 10. Yeshua said to him, rise, take up your bed, and walk. And on the same day was the Sabbath. The Jews therefore said unto him that was cured, it is the Sabbath day. It is not lawful, that is according to the oral law, for you to carry your bed on the Sabbath. So they didn't have any complaint that he healed on the Sabbath because it's not forbidden to do good. Their complaint was that Yeshua instructed the one that was healed to carry his bed, which would constitute work according to the Pharisees or the oral law. And so the debate or the conflict that Yeshua was having on the Sabbath was not whether you should follow the Sabbath because that is a written commandment. And so if you're in covenant relationship with the God of Israel, if you're in covenant relationship with the one who gave the Torah, that is Yeshua, then he instructed us to follow the Sabbath. But, if you carry your bed on the Sabbath, does that mean that you're violating the Sabbath? That is the issue of debate here. And according to the Pharisees, by Yeshua giving instruction to the one that got healed on the Sabbath to carry his bed, to the Pharisees, Yeshua was destroying the Torah. But for Yeshua, he was fulfilling the Torah. He was correctly teaching it. So, how did the rabbis teach 
the way in which you are to keep the Sabbath. Well, the written commandment regarding the Sabbath is you are not to work on the Sabbath. So the rabbis defined 39 categories of work on the Sabbath that appears in the Talmud in Shabbat 73a. And they included the following. Sowing, plowing, reaping, binding sheaves, threshing, winnowing, selecting, grinding, sifting, kneading, baking, sharing wool, washing wool, beating wool, dyeing wool, spinning, weaving, making two loops, weaving two threads, separating two threads. Tying, untying, sewing two stitches, tearing, trapping, slaughtering, flaying, salting meat, curing hide, scraping hide, cutting hide up, writing two letters, erasing two letters, building, tearing a building down, extinguishing a fire, kindling a fire, hitting with a hammer, and taking an object from one domain to another. So doing any of these activities on the Sabbath, according to the rabbis, was violating the Sabbath, doing work on the Sabbath. So plucking corn on the Sabbath was seen by the rabbis as working. Matthew chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. At that time, Yeshua went on the Sabbath day through the corn, and his disciples were hungry and began to pluck ears of corn and to eat. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto him, Behold, your disciples do that which is not lawful, that is, according to the oral law, to do upon the Sabbath day. And so the contention here was not if you follow the Sabbath, but how you follow the Sabbath. And so the Pharisees or the rabbis had 39 categories of work. And one of those, plucking an ear, would be regarded as working, thus forbidden on the Sabbath. Yet Yeshua's disciples, they did pluck an ear of corn on the Sabbath. And Yeshua gave instruction to one that got healed on the Sabbath to take up his bed and walk. Yeshua taught that following his Torah will bring rest to your soul. In Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 16, it is written, Thus says the Lord, Ask for the old paths, which is the good way, and walk therein, and you shall find rest for your soul. This is what Yeshua was referring to in Matthew chapter 11, verses 29 and 30, as it is written, Take my yoke upon you, that is, the way in which you follow the Torah, and learn of me. Learn of me how you are to follow the Torah, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and if you do, now he's making a reference back to Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 16, and you shall find rest for your soul. Then Yeshua says about following his Torah, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So there's a contrast between the Pharisees, rabbinic Judaism, and the way they taught the people to follow the Torah, which they said it was to be followed according to their rulings and their decrees, which God himself is obligated to follow, where Yeshua is advocating follow the Torah, but he is showing that the Pharisees, in certain instances, are incorrectly interpreting and teaching others to follow the Torah, in effect, destroying the Torah. And so, because there was going to be a different scene between how Yeshua followed the Torah and given that he gave the Torah, and he said the authority and the things that I do and the things that I teach come from my father. He didn't say that he's under the authority of the rabbis. There was going to be conflict, and there were going to be those who's going to think that Yeshua and even his disciples were not correctly following the Torah. So that's why Yeshua says, don't even think that thought. I didn't come to not follow the Torah. I didn't come to not do it properly. And I didn't come to incorrectly teach it. I've come to properly show you how you are to follow the Torah. And so how do the scriptures say that we are to follow Yeshua's Torah? 
we are to take the written instructions, the written Torah, which contain things that we are able to understand and do. But in the written Torah is contained for us principles. And so the way in which we are to live out that Torah is the Torah is to be written on our heart and we are to receive help and instruction on how to follow that Torah by the Spirit of God, by the Ruach HaKodesh. And so this is what Yeshua was teaching and advocating, is you follow Yeshua's Torah by following the written commandments, and you are led in following them by His Holy Spirit. And this is what Paul taught in Romans chapter 7, verse 22. I delight in the Torah of God because I follow the rulings and the teachings of the rabbis? Well, initially Paul did. But when he came to faith in Yeshua, Paul didn't quit following the Torah. He changed the way in which he followed the Torah. And now he looked to follow the Torah as Yeshua taught and as Yeshua taught his disciples by the Holy Spirit. And so then, in looking at this teaching then, we primarily looked at John chapter 1, verse 17, Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 and 18, and Matthew chapter 15, verses 1 and 2. Because, among other things, these are among the verses that traditional Christianity misunderstands and quotes as evidence that we are not to follow Torah now being believers in Yeshua as the Messiah. But if you look at these verses in its Hebraic context, in its Hebraic background, you will be able to understand the verses for what they are really communicating. And so in John chapter 1 verse 17, it says that the Torah was given by Moses, but the truth and the grace was shown or revealed by and through the life and ministry and teachings and example of Yeshua the Messiah. And so because the way in which he followed the Torah, because Yeshua gave the Torah, so he knew the intent and the heart of the commandments. And given that he was correctly teaching the way you follow the Torah, to his disciples and in certain instances that was going to be in conflict with the way the Torah was followed in the society around him, there was going to come accusation that Yeshua and his disciples were not following the Torah or not correctly following the Torah. And so Yeshua made it known, don't even think that thought that I've come to show you the correct way to follow the Torah and the correct interpretation of the Torah. So not only am I showing you how to follow the Torah, but every letter in the Torah will be fulfilled. Even the decoration crowns will be fulfilled. And that we are to follow Torah by His Spirit. We are not to look to rabbinical decrees as being our authority in how we follow the Torah because Yeshua taught that his doctrine was not his own, but he followed what he was given to do by his father. So whose Torah do you believe? We believe the Torah of Yeshua and we follow his Torah by his Holy Spirit. Now remember always these words from 1 John in chapter 2 and verse 6. He who says he abides in him, he who says that he's a believer in Yeshua as the Messiah, ought himself to walk, that means to live our lives, even as he walked. And how did Yeshua walk? How did he live his life? 
he followed the Torah of his father. Even so, he commanded us in John chapter 14, verse 15. If you love me, keep my commandments or follow Yeshua's Torah. Shalom in Yeshua the Messiah. Amen.